I'm Jonathan Davis. I'm Gavin Ensign. And you're watching Rugby, Rugby Rapper. Rapper. Brought to you by our friends of the British Council. Hey everybody, Matt McCarthy for Rugby Wrap-Up. We are back at the Studio 34 Fantasy Sports Network here on West 35th Street in New York City. And we have some esteemed guests uh, that will be uh, associated with the MLR, Major League Rugby, in this upcoming 2018 season, but only in the exhibition sense. Uh, with us is uh, Mr. Mike Tolkien who many of you may or may not recognize. Uh, Mike uh, has been around the rugby stratosphere here in the U United States for quite some time, including Mike being the head coach of Team USA during the Rugby World Cup in 2015. Right now, you are the initial head coach for the MLR franchise, set to kick off their exhibition season in 2018. On this side of me is Mr. James Kennedy, uh, on the board of directors of the MLR, but more importantly, he is the founder and chairman of the New York franchise. And he is the founder and big shot of the Murphy Kennedy Group, a construction firm here in New York City. On the far right, my friend from Western New York, uh, Mr. Kevin McCrory, <laughs> right? Uh, Kevin is a uh, St. Bonaventure grad. He grew up in Rochester, played for Old Blue, uh, played for St. Bonaventure. He is now here, and he is the director or the assistant director of operations for the MLR franchise. Gentlemen, welcome. Hey, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Good to yeah, be here. Thanks for having me. Good. That was they were they're dripping with sincerity. Those <laughs> hey, Matt's uh, guys. Uh, this is some big stuff we're talking about here today. We've got you guys are we're really uh, doing it. We're going to have a New York rugby franchise in in the MLR. You're going to test the waters a little bit, work some logistical things out. But James, um, what's the initial uh, word from the, for the franchise? Uh, I just we're very excited. Um, um, the feedback from. Um, investors and sponsors have been fantastic. Uh, all the clubs in, in the Empire GU have, have given us support. As, um, we're working on our way through the colleges and the high schools right now. It, it's it's extraordinarily exciting. Um, the, the the energy coming off the the rugby community is, is fantastic. So you're taking the you're taking the bull by the horns here. And uh, why the exhibition season? Why not right into the initial season? Because they're kicking off. Uh, what we got seven teams west of the Mississippi. Yeah, they're kicking off in, in April. Um, to be quite frank, we just weren't ready. We wouldn't have been ready. Um, we could have done something. We've got a great player pool here. Um, Mike has come on as head coach. Um, he's put a great coaching ticket together. He'll talk about that. Uh, we just needed time. We want to do it right. You get only get one first time. you know. So we wanted to be right and work the kinks out with a few games this year. And... Uh, it, you know, we're doing as much as we can for the league as far as sponsorship and, and, and all that, but we'll just work the kinks out here and, and hopefully get some other teams on the East Coast involved as well so we can have local rivalries. I know we're working hard on Boston and D.C., so... Um, and and Tor Tor Toronto? Toronto are, yeah. are, 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 are talking about coming in next year. Um, Chicago are there, thereabouts. So um, it would be nice to come in and, and bring it and have some, some Northeast rivals at the same time. That's cool. Kevin, what's your uh, role in this, in, in the operations end? Uh, <clears throat> so I kind of feed off of James, Nishant, and Mike. Um, I'm able to learn the process that Mike's going to put forward here and kind of help with, like, player management and logistics of, like, the training and whatnot. And then on the other side, like, the business side, uh, corporate sponsorship, like he was talking about, doing it right. Um, we're building from the ground up, and, you know, there's a lot to do. So uh, we're, we're hitting the ground every morning, 8 a.m., sharp. And you know corporate sponsorships. Six a.m. for me. Buddy. Six a.m. <laughs> Sorry, I, I like to sleep in. Six a.m. So. so yeah, no, I get my hands into everything, learning the business acumen from from James, and he's you know he's been successful with MKG, and you know I get to learn from Mike, who like you said before, he coached the USA, so it's a great learning opportunity for me on both sides. Excellent, excellent, uh, coach. You've heard from the administrative geeks over here. <laughs> uh, you're the guy that's uh, tasked with fielding a team. So tell us about that process. Well, I think it's, a, you know, James has put forward a great idea here. He's, he's shown great enthusiasm. You know, from the get-go, he knew what he wanted to do, and it's underway. And uh, it came together quick, but I think it was smart that he's not going into full MLR. 
because we're not ready. But having said that, you know, the, the team will be taken care of, well looked after, and uh, we hope having success in our, in our limited schedule this year. Do we have a, a kickoff of a first match yet? I guess we're, we're playing um, some, some low-key games uh, to, to kind of judge our level of ability and, and run, this, run through the squad. We've got, Mike, is it 55 players we're looking at right now? Yeah, about 50, 55 players so, at large squad. Yeah, so we'll be, we're looking at March 24th for our, 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 our kind of our opening game or our coming out game. We'll have played a few games before that to test the squad out, run through, uh, the coaches have ideas, uh, test we're, out logistics. Any uh, where, where any ideas where the match will be? Is that locked down yet? Or? It, it's it's either Gelly Park or Fordham. Um, we we've got tinted, we have a good agreement with the GAA to play in Gelly Park, but there's some logistical challenges around the, the renovation of the stadium. Can you tell folks at home what the GAA is? It's the Gaelic Athletic Association for New York. It's the Irish Sports Council okay. in, in in New York. And they're building a facility in Yonkers. Um, no, we're proposing to build a facility with them in Yonkers. We're meeting with the mayor of Yonkers tomorrow. Um, That'll be a multi-sport for-profit facility, um, teaming with soccer, GAA, lacrosse, and, and high schools in Yonkers. So, I mean, that's, that's in the planning stages. Um, Yonkers have been very receptive. The, the government in Yonkers have been very receptive. So, hopefully, we can get that off the ground. Any training sessions so far? Not yet. Uh, about a month's time. So, we're just uh, gathering the squad up, getting the logistics together. And we want to uh, hit the ground running, you know, in mid-February. Uh, but we're you know we're well underway for getting that process started with the staff with the with the players, and then into the games about a month after that. Who's your coaching staff? Do you have a staff yet? We do. Uh, we have uh, Bruce McLean. We have Andrew Britt from Village Lions. We have Vili from Lansdowne. Oh. Um, we have Kevin, who's going to be doing managing as well as operations with us. So we're we're really trying to build a coalition from uh, you know from all over the league um, as part of James's vision and it's the right vision you know if you go back in uh, in time when it used to be the old met union you know we've amalgamated a lot of great clubs and players in met union and in the past it was a successful product you know and we want to do that we know we can do that again and, uh, and sorry and an involvement from the clubs is critical so we had morris in our office last week um morris is not the first name of some individual folks it's a it's a team in new jersey yeah it's a team in new jersey um we've had great conversations with greenwich fairfield um on our way to buffalo this weekend syracuse we're going to we're flying to buffalo this friday to meet the teams up there so we're we're, we're reaching out and, and getting ideas players coaches from from all the clubs all right we're going to take a quick break uh and come right back with more Major League Rugby chat right after this. Nudge the, the Dragons player. Oh, there you go, Jeff. Yes. Looking a lot better there. Than, uh, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. We sip, we peel, and we slide. Slide? Nah, like this. We sip, we peel, we wet. I think we're getting this. Grab a large or extra large freshly ground, freshly brewed hot coffee for your chance to win great prizes, like free coffee for a year. Get your celebration ready, Dunkin' Donuts. This is coffee, this is winning. Hey, we're back at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 for Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy and our esteemed guests continuing on. Mr. Kevin uh, McRory, Mr. Uh, James Kennedy, and Mr. Mike Tolkien. Uh, James, yep. you're um, also on the board for the league, correct? That's correct, yeah. All right, so a couple of league-wide questions I have for you. Um, you know, the, the, there's all kinds of things on the Internet about uh, the salary cap and the ability to maybe fudge the salary cap according to your team or your franchise. What's the oversight situation by the league? Well, I mean, all the players essentially contracted, I think as you know, so on the MLS model, the players are contracted by the league, so there's control there. And the other idea of the single entity league is that we're all owners of the league. So, yeah, in, in New York, could I break salary cap? I could. Could I build a great team? I could, but... I lose value because I can't go and beat an, a, a, a rival. I can't hammer a rival. Everybody has to be equally strong. Parity 
is is the cornerstone on this this whole thing. It, it's built on parity. So, and if teams don't get it, if there's an ownership group that doesn't get it, and that, that hasn't presented itself to this at this point, but if it does present itself, I mean, it'll be obvious, and and it, they'll be voted out of the league straight away. Um, so, but, but but then you also have the the uh, other side of that is for the fans, they want the best team, right? So. You want to win, so how do you juggle the... We got the best coach in America. That's how we win. <laughs> that's not my question. No, that's the answer. That's, uh, oh, that's <laughs> the answer, and you're sticking to it. Okay, no, so, but uh, basically what, what we're looking at then is, uh, hey, uh, I'm not going to be that guy, right? Is that what you... You got a message? I think I'm um, just looking at my notes. Okay, all right. Fair enough. I thought you were getting a text from no, the league uh, right now telling you it's take, cease take, and desist, text from the league. No, yeah. I, listen, there's there's oversight. The, the, it, the players essentially contracted. The league office knows what players are paid, what they're starting on what team. So outside of that, if if it's obvious, if, if I don't know, if our fly half buys a Mercedes and he's only on, Twenty grand, then suspicious. It's suspicious. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, I go back to the single into the into the league. It, we cannot survive if one team j- jumps jumps ahead of another team, and it's it's obviously possible. I mean, you can't even in the Premiership they're not enforcing those rules. You know, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I don't want to address a specific team, but it, there's examples out there, right? So we have to have parity, and we w- we also want quality. We want the the best rugby possible, and that will come through games. And I think Mike will talk about that. I mean, I'm not qualified at all to talk about that, but from a business perspective, uh, we we can't have one team jumping ahead of another team uh, uh, by bending rules. And it'll be it, it's such a small community out here, you know. Right. It, 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 internationally, rugby is so small um, or, or close. Uh, it'll be very obvious very quickly, and w- it, it's just a group of votes, and you're out. You're done. Mike, as the coach. You want to get the best guys out there that you can. No doubt. Are you going to try to talk him into just skirting the salary cap at any turn? Uh, listen, I'm going to do what I do, and he'll do what he does. <laughs> yeah. that, that's how it goes in New York. <laughs> yeah. um, but listen, the philosophy of, of, a, of a nascent league, that has to happen. There's got to be parity. Um, over time, as the league goes on, you know, I'm always a believer in, in, in survival of the fittest. Um, but that, that's a long way away from now. Yeah. We, just got, we have to survive. And we have to have a good product in the field. It does nothing to have a hundred point win, you know, over some teams week after week. Right. Just if I jump in there, the, the damage that can be done to the the game of rugby in the U.S. If there is a huge margin of victory live on CBS on a Saturday night, and some team gets blown up by some other team, and that's not obvious at all looking at player pools. I don't think that will happen. But but the damage that will do to the whole game, right from grassroots to top, is is could be unrepairable. So. It, it behoves us to make sure that there's parity. And parity goes both ways. If, if, if there's a team with a weakened pair pool, maybe through injuries and, and uh, external factors, uh, our responsibility is to support that team and get them players, right, I would say, Mike? Yeah, Yeah. listen, it, right now there is nothing more important than the survival of the league. It's the first year. We know we're coming off um, you know, a situation in the past league that you know, we need some repair, some damage repair. And uh, the games have to be competitive, entertaining. You know, there's got to be a winner over time. I mean, whether that's five, ten years, you know, then teams who can't keep up, obviously, then then they drop out and other teams replace them. But for now, we need good competitive games, and that's what the that's what the fans would uh, want to see. Good point, uh, James. How does the existing first year limit your talent pool, or or make your talent pool a little bit more difficult? Um, I'm going to give you one of those short answers that you don't like. It, it doesn't. Um, luckily enough, we're in New York and there's players that want to be here because they have other careers. Um, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to mention names, Mike, but um, there's guys that we all know that, that would need to stay here to focus on the careers that would make almost any rugby team. Matt McCarthy. Matt McCarthy being the obvious one, I, you know. Um, <laughs> It, it doesn't really, and, and, and we, we talk to the players that are here, you know, as I said before, there's 50 plus clubs in the Empire GU, so there's an amazing pool of players out there, and we talk to them regularly about, you know, they're getting offer contracts, should they go, will they go, and um, we're being very transparent on that, um, and a lot of players are choosing to stay here, and we're getting, you know, 
every day we're getting CVs and, and videos in and applications in from players from the existing academies throughout Europe that, that want to give you, the U.S. a shot. Well, I don't doubt that. I mean, you know, if you're a player and there's a professional league, a professional setup in America that's going to actually have some sustainability, hell, come on over. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's wet and cold and in Glasgow and... But, but, but I'll say that that works both ways. I, I know that the European teams, and I know this for, for the fact that are, are excited to look at, at these games and all every single game will be now live broadcast. So they're excited to look at these games and find talent for their clubs in Europe. So, so I'm sorry, so you, you just touched upon... We're going to go two things. I want to get to uh, Europe, but uh, TV deal? Expanded but, TV deal or is this the CBS? No, deal? the CBS deal is still is still there. Uh, it's local broadcast. Um, the league has done a very good job and is doing a very good job at negotiating local broadcast deals with every club that's playing in the league this year. So, I believe there might be one club that's still in negotiation, but uh, say ninety percent is is done. Um, so, um, pr I'm pretty confident in saying that that every game will be live broadcast locally um, and 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 OTT. As well as as, as your game of the week, to so, be so the, expo that, so the exposure yeah. for the players is tremendous. All right, so let's segue because we are running out of time. Unfortunately, these things fly by. Um, the rumors you heard Will Chang on here recently talk about potential of Pro 14 being welcomed here on American soil as well. How does that impact you? as a businessman in the MLR? It, it doesn't. I mean, Pro 14, whatever they do, they do. I mean, right now they're behind a paywall with 11,000 subscribers. We, we, MLR is going to 65 million viewers, so I, I, it's fine. Where'd you get that number? We, we'll, 65 million viewers. It's the CBS viewers oh, number. But we're not saying that you, we don't have a guarantee of 65 million viewers. That would be, no, that we would don't, be wonderful. We, well, we, I would love that. But... Um, it, it, listen, it, it doesn't concern me. Can it we doesn't. quote you right here? And <laughs> so we have 65 million viewers in the first... <laughs> let me let me throw a potential in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. We'll put it in subtitles. We factor in them, Irish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's no problem. No problem. Fully understood. Uh, I just want to go back to the, the TV broadcast deal. Um, I, I, there, there's conversations with overseas networks as well. And we have contracted an MLR over Irish, 30 Irish players over 25 or just under 25 sure. Kiwi players, over 30 Australian players, and these are not low level players. So there is a lot of interest from overseas for TV deals as well. So Absolutely, Mike, when we were on the World Cup tour, all the other nations, all the other media managers specifically were all like, here comes the potential monster awakening and they were all, they all wanna see what happens here. Yeah, well listen, even going way back to amateur days, I mean, it's, it's New York City, I mean, this is, you know the attraction of expats you know yeah. for many different reasons besides rugby but now there's a, a pathway for rugby so i think it uh we have a lot of attraction here you know for a variety can, can of i just say because I, I talked about uh foreign foreign players i i'm in foreign born players most of those players are u.s qualified so when i say 30 irish 24 kiwi 30 australian they are majority u.s qualified players uh, would that be correct mike you yeah know, listen uh, yeah. i mean that's going to be a big part of not only us but the whole mlr is around the world you know uncovering the American eligible players. Yeah, build, right. building the national team is, yeah. is one of our mandates. So. Well, I think what you guys are doing is smart. You know, specifically, I think what the MLR is doing is is pretty smart in a lot of ways. Let me ask you this question: Why call it professional right out of the gate with the MLR? Because you do have guys that have to have day jobs, right? So you're paying you're paying someone to play a game. Why not call it semi-pro though? And lower the lower the expectations. I think that well, I, I think that, that that doesn't market well. To be quite, quite frank, it doesn't market well. It doesn't test well. I mean, semi is it's it's a new it's it's a it, it doesn't belong in a conversation. Hey, Matt, what do you get paid? You're a professional. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's you know. It's true. And there's it, it's there's nothing it, else in America that yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, these guys are training five five six. They're they're training seven times a week, double doing two a days. Um, they're being treated like professionals. They're acting like professionals. They're eating like professionals. You know, so and I think the they big, are professionals. The, it, it would be a disservice to the players, I think, to call them semi. Right. I mean, they are not semi. They they are in. They 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 understand that the money isn't well, there. Triple A ball players and junior hockey ball uh, hockey players are still called professionals. A single A player in in baseball is a professional player. Sure. And it's more, as James says, it's about the approach of the player and the coaching staff and the organization. Yeah. It's professional. The money isn't there yet but it's a professional approach. And, and to be honest, if the, if the money was there, the league wouldn't last, right? It has to be sustainable. You know, that's what I liked about this model. That's what I liked about the salary cap. It's it's conservative. It's conservative. realistic. It's realistic, yeah. yeah. All right, so five-year 
vision? Um, to 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 be to play the players um, in comparison to what they would get in Europe. So the players are being paid, and as you said, they're full time, not worried about a day job or so on. And some of them in rugby, some of them always do, to be honest with you. There's professionals in Europe now that have other jobs. Um, to have a, a, a grassroots system in place, like completely synch synchronized and integrated grassroots system, uh, which feeds into clubs, which then feeds into pro, the pro rugby, professional rugby setup at MLR, and then which feeds onto the national team. So synergy. Um, uh, World Championship in the MLR for the New York franchise? I, I think that I'd like to be either invitational or, or in some format to be playing um, an, an MLR champion to be playing uh, European and, and uh, oh, some like summer Summer Olympic champions. Like um, in whatever format would dictate, I think it, it would be very attractive. I mean, if the MLR champion is New York or Boston or or Denver, or whoever it is, you know, um, you know that what it can do for the game as far as viewership would be tremendous. All right, we uh, are we are getting the, uh, the signal and, oh, and, and, and every MLR club will have functionally existing academies where they can uh, bring players in and grow them and you know, fair enough, grow talent. fair enough. You guys have been great, uh, uh, Kevin. I know that you you're buried in the New York Rugby Club corner over there, and I just wanted to give you with your old blue jacket one final. <laughs> uh, chance to comment. I was trying to, you know, even out the space out here. Uh, no, I am very excited about this opportunity. Um, I think with like everything we were talking about with players and whatnot and growing the game organically and uh, really relying on the clubs and the entire Empire GU is really going to help us with the, the five-year plan that he just laid out. Um, so thank you very much for having me. All right, guys, uh, we are officially out of time. I want to thank you for coming on, rooting for the MLR to work. I happen to know a rugby show in New York City that's that's uh, ready to, to cover it, and I uh, know a couple of guys that might be willing to be spokespersons for the league. Anyway, uh, Matt McCarthy for Mr. Kevin <laughs> McCrory, Mr. James Kennedy, and Mr. Mike Tolkien at the Studio 34 Fantasy Sports Network here on West 35th Street in New York City, signing off. <laughs>